Commissioning a TV show or film is no different to getting the idea that you have and you go to your boss or to an investor or to a friend or someone like that and you pitch the idea to them. You say whatever bullshit you say to be able to get the money. And then they go, okay, you can do it. And they give you the money. And then you look at each other and think, oh, what are we going to do now? You know, we actually have to do it. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, how the son of a legendary film director and friend to the man who played Obi-Wan Kenobi went from being a house painter to somehow launching a television career that's lasted almost two decades, all as the guy who rides motorcycles around the world for fun. Before we kick off today's show, please know that this episode comes with a warning. Dear viewers, listeners, okay. I'm a massive fan of today's guest, and as you will see, I, I do a terrible job of hiding it. <laughs> because a little over 15 years ago, my brother-in-law asked me if I heard of this television show where Ewan McGregor and his friend ride around the world on motorcycles. And while Ewan McGregor was a name that I knew from early Danny Boyle films like Train Spotting and A Life Less Ordinary, not to mention Star Wars and Moulin Rouge and Big Fish and a whole lot more, watching the television show where these two guys literally ride around the world from London, England, all the way to New York on motorcycles, it just, it tapped into my deep need for adventure. And in watching the show over and over and over again. I quickly became a fan of Charlie's quick wit, his direct take on things. And to be honest, it's kind of fun to watch things go wrong, which they often did. Now, if you flash forward 15 years to today, Charlie's known for his adventure riding and he's a spokesperson for motorcycle brands. He's written a few books despite being dyslexic. And he's completed three of these different trips to different parts of the world with his friend Ewan. But before any of that, Many people don't know that Charlie grew up in a creative family. He was one of four children, the legendary John Borman, uh, the director of films like Deliverance, Exorcist II, Excalibur, and a whole bunch more. And that is actually where Charlie got his start as an actor. Whenever there was a, a part for a kid in the, in the film, he, he said, no, 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 don't pay for any. I've got four free children. So <laughs> right. we would just... It was a financial thing, really, not, 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 no, nothing creative at all. It was just, you know, get them in, don't pay them, get them out. And um, I think the first film I was ever in, uh, and which I, which I remember, was, um, was a film called, uh, called Deliverance. I don't know if anybody's seen Deliverance, but, but with Burt Reynolds and John Voight and Ned Beatty, they go down this, this river together and all the hell breaks out. And, and, um, uh, and at the very end of the movie, John Voight goes back to his wife and there's a little boy sitting on a sofa and and that's me but, but spoiler but yeah. alert so, <laughs> spoiler alert yeah exactly <laughs> but um and and so and then as my school school carried on it became apparent that i was very badly dyslexic and so i i, I wasn't really going to go to university or or you know my 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 schooling um wasn't going to go that far so but i always loved acting and and i i i found a way of expressing myself in school um uh, and i was in school plays and and stuff like that. And so I think my father sort of saw that. And so he kind of encouraged it. And then I think my acting career went, started heading south because I kept, I had some success in the 80s, but then I kept choosing movies for their location. So, you know, they would say, oh, this movie's in Africa. Go, I'll do it. And then, then I'd read the script on the plane and think, well, that's shit. But, you know, it's a nice location. Well, and, I, was, and so, I was wondering because because your your acting career does have this arc. And from an outside point yeah, well, of view, I couldn't. And then a cliff, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's I kind of you'd say arc. <laughs> it it has an arc. Uh, I I couldn't help but wonder whether acting was your thing, like your mm. thing, or it was the family business, and you kind of felt obliged to kind of yeah. pursue it. I never felt obliged. I, I I kind of sort of I suppose I fell into it as I got older. I found it more and um, harder and harder to learn lines and, and I would get super stressed out. I remember making a movie with Ewan and 
he wouldn't even look at the lines until until the morning and and he would just look at them on a piece of paper and that was it and i'd spend weeks trying to learn these things there's something about my dyslexia ahead if, if i had to learn paragraphs of, of text it, it it just i just couldn't remember it and it would put myself i just put myself through just turmoil and hell um doing it so i, th- I think i slowly got put off and and plus, in fact, my choice of movies was always bad and 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 um, or unlucky. I don't know whichever one. Um, and so I just slowly that slowly faded away. And then and then I started doing more and more painting and decorating to keeping things going. And then the painting and decorating turned into doing people's houses up and you know doing more stuff. And and at that point, I then started to think, well, actually, maybe maybe this is what I'm I'm going to have to do and and do it more professionally to try and you know, make a, a career out of it. In that 10 years, I, I, I did the odd movie. And then on, on one of the movies, I met I met Ewan um, making a film called The Serpent's Kiss, which which was brilliant fun, but just an absolute movie. And I thought this was my comeback. You know, it had Pete Postlethwaite, Greta Scacchi, Richard E. Grant, Ewan McGregor. I mean, I just thought, wow, this is, you know, anyway, it just didn't work out. But, um, but, but, but I want to uh, spend some time in the, those 10 but years. But the friendship was there. Yeah, yeah, I want to spend some time in those 10 years. So, you know, the movie career, you have you have something here and there kind of every few years. You're doing, mm. you know, the home renovations and the decorating and the painting. And uh, and that did that feel like a cop out? Did that feel I mean, you, you have you have a life, you have kids, you have to support yourself. Uh, mm. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, you're a trust fund kid or anything. And so did it did it feel like at that time? a creative outlet and something you were good at and something that, that that was going to be the rest of your life? Or did it always feel like second best to your true craft? I certainly felt that, and, and you know, I didn't have any education either. So I left school at 16. So, you know, I couldn't fall back on being a, being a, uh, a banker, you know, <laughs> uh, a baker or, or anything really, you know, I, to a degree, I'd sort of resolved the fact that I was going to, you know, that was it. You know, and and I didn't mind. I, I enjoyed it, and and I could I could support my family, and and you know I was I was I was doing better and better and better at it, and 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 you know I could easily have I think looking back I could have probably made a bit of money. I would have I would have you know started I was starting to think about buying a a little property, doing it up, and renting it out. You know, usual usual thing. But yeah, I think there was definitely something missing. You know, uh, and that there was a, a right deep enough. I was to be honest. Uh, they were right deep in my heart. There, I think there was a bit of sadness there because of you know that I I didn't quite get it right in in the you know in the acting world. So Charlie's at the point where the acting career <laughs> fell off a cliff, as he said, and and this is where the old line. It's kind of a funny story. You know you know that line when people are like, well, it's kind of a funny story. I love that. I think this perfectly fits here because looking back, looking backwards, all the dots in Charlie's story, all the twists and the turns, everything makes total sense. It connects so well. And yet how this man went from failed actor, and I know that sounds harsh and I feel bad saying that, but but from failed actor and house painter to professional television host who has spent the last 20 years riding motorcycles, building a career around his passions, it can't help but feel like one of those it's kind of a funny story moments. And so you've got to hear this. You've got to hear the true story of how Long Way Round, the first television show he did with Ewan McGregor, how this became a real thing. I think it's one of those things where, where you know, you, you, you knock around, you, you ride motorbikes together, you, you do some, you know, we did some track days where you go and you take your motorbike on a motorcycle on a racetrack. We did that. Then we would go away for two or three days at a time, you know, whatever it was. And and, and then I think you're right. We were looking for, for something a little bit more. So we, we, we started talking about, you know, riding down to, to the south of Spain. My wife's parents uh, have a place down there. We, we, thought, we, we thought, you know, just a little tiny place down there. And, and, and we thought, well, we, we'd, we'd ride down to meet our, our wives and children down there and then have a little holiday and then ride back. And, and so we sort of started thinking about all those kind of things as you do sitting in a pub, having a pint or whatever it was, you know, or, or every dinner. And then one day you, you really was like, he said, look, Charlie, let, let's, um, uh, I've got this idea. Why don't you come around to the house? And, and, um, and came around and he had this map on the, on the table. And he said, look, you know, my, 
his wife at the time was 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 um was brought up in China and we thought we'd ride to China and 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 I thought well, that's not a bad idea. And then we thought, well, and then we thought, well, you know, maybe not China. And then we'd met we we met this guy online who he he'd done this thing called Millennium Ride in 2000 and he'd gone through Mongolia and Far East Russia on the road of bones. And we thought, wow. And then he sent us some photos and stuff. And he said, look, it really is a, an amazing place. You know, Mongolia looks like Mars and places. And, you know, it's, it's really truly one of the few countries left in the world that is that is still quite remote and, and unspoiled. We thought we'd do that. And then if we're going to go all the way to the other side of Russia, then we may as well just carry on and go to New York. It seemed so <laughs> logical at the time. And I remember our wives... I remember we were seeing them. Both our wives were, were, were having dinner when we were talking about it with us, and we and they said, "I think Ev or Ollie, I can't remember which one." Said, "Well, how, how long do you think it's going to take?" And we said, "Oh, I don't know, about four and a half months." And they both went, "Okay." Wow! <laughs> I just thought I just thought it was a little a little fast, you know. To, I just got the feeling they were trying to get rid of us, you know. <clears throat> and I was still doing painting and decorating. I was still. I remember I really I didn't have the money to do it, yeah. so. You know, I had a wife, two children. I was, you know, doing people's houses up. I wasn't making a great deal of money. So I said, I'm, just, I'm not sure if I can afford it. And and that's when we both, someone mentioned about a book and said, oh, you know, two friends riding a motorcycle around the world. What a great, um, what a great book that would make, you know. And and so we, we kind of sort of knocked around the idea of a book. And, and, and that seemed kind of possible, you know. Yeah. And, and and there was money there, and we thought, well, okay. But but and then we <laughs> I said, well, hang on a minute, you know, we, we we could get this book to it, but I I'm fucking dyslexic, and I can't <laughs> I can't even. It took me a month just to just to learn how to spell my wife's name. And you said, well, I'm not great at the writing side of it. And so that's when we thought we we'd do video diaries. And then we thought, well, if we're going to do video diaries, maybe we should film it. You know, and that made sense. And then we thought, well, I don't know how we're going to film it. And so, and, and you and I think was making Big Fish at the time. I think it was Big Fish, and and uh, with Tim Burton. And, and and he said, look, I'm back at this time. Why don't you see if you see a few producers and see if we can, you know, get someone to help us with this? So I said, yeah, 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 no problem. Tim, put the phone down. <laughs> he rang and he said, Charlie, look, I'm back in in a couple in a week's time. What have you done about? You know, the producer, I said, yeah, yeah, no, I've got a couple lined up. I put the phone down and thought, shit, I haven't done anything. So I, I frantically was looking around and I'd met this guy at a, at a, at a, a housewarming of the house that I'd done up. Uh, I met him, this guy called Russ Malkin. And, and he said that he'd made TV shows on motorbikes and, and stuff like that. And you had this production company. We just chatted away. Anyway, he gave me his card. Out of sheer panic and desperation, I, I rang him and said, look, you know, this one I'm thinking about doing with you and McGregor. And he thought, oh, okay. I don't think he kind of believed me, really. And then and then, then I had to cancel it a couple of times because, you know, the timing the Ewan was delayed or I can't remember what it was. And um, and then I think he suddenly... So he thought you were really this full is, of shit at that point. This is full of shit, basically. <laughs> anyway, finally, we got it together. And R- Russ always told the story is that he heard the two motorbikes turn up and he looked down and then he saw that it was Ewan and he thought, holy he, it is anyway he had this little little production office in, in, in his house and he turned to everyone and said look everyone, everyone looked really busy <laughs> <laughs> so he came up and we sat and we had this conversation and, and and so that's kind of kind of how it how it began the book deal was actually quite easy because you know you you the pitches that we're going to go from london to new york two great mates on mother bikes don't know what's going to happen but yeah, but go on, and, and that's it, it helps that book, you guys are right? known known quantities as well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, you and I, no one knew who the f- I was, but but um, uh, but but when you're pitching it as a TV show, and you're saying, look, we're going to go from here to here, but we don't really know what's going to happen, and you know, the TV people go, really, that's not much of a TV show, you know, and and so that was a harder sell, even with you and being there, you know, we then made a little pilot. Um, you and was shooting Star Wars in in um. That's when you went in to Australia, Australia, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 um, and we went and we 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 just over over two days we made this little pilot of what it would be like, and that helped people. But we thought we thought in Australia while we were in Australia we'd we'd, we'd hit one of the TV stations in Australia, and see if they wanted you know to commission it, and and we sat down we pitched this idea 
to this guy and he's politely listened to the whole thing and he said he said um, and we said uh, well you know what do you think and he goes well do you want me to tell you what i really think and we said yeah yeah and i would really like to know and he goes well i think two wankers on motorcycles <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that was it so we thought okay well that's not gonna work um uh but anyway a year later we sold it to him for quite a lot of money so. <laughs> i love that that was the uh, the turnaround there so so the tv side of it was was much harder pitch really and and in the end we we actually made a little a little like two minute teaser to give people the idea of of of, of what it was and and sky over here their big sort of you, you know um satellite channel and and they'd passed on it and um and then my brother-in-law was working for sky so the guy who's married to my wife's sister um and he came to the leaving party because we were leaving anyway, but we didn't have a British broadcasting deal. And, and um, I, think we, I think we got one in the States. And, and, um, and then he saw it and he saw the, the, the filming. You know, we were playing this loop uh, of what we'd shot so far, of, of all the preparations, you know, those first couple of episodes of Long Way. Yeah, yeah. And he saw it and he came up to me and he said, Charlie, it's at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, you'll have a contract. Uh, and uh, we won it, and and so and so that was at ten o'clock the next morning. This uh, um, this courier came and um, with a contract, and so that we got our British broadcaster, um, and then off we went. And then they, all we had to do was film it. And none of us had a clue. And then you just to had do. to fulfill the contract, right? <laughs> yeah, because you say any old rubbish to 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 to, to get it. Then you know, commissioning a TV show or, or film or whatever is no different to to getting a an, an idea any idea that you have and you go to to your boss or to the bank or, or to an investor or to a friend or someone like that and you pitch the idea to them don't you and you you say whatever bullshit you say to be able to get the money and then they go okay you can do it and they give you the money and then you look at each other and think oh what are we going to do now you know we actually have to do it there's a life lesson in what Charlie just said. Because so many of us dream of these adventures. I mean, listen, 15 years ago when I was watching this show over and over and over again and it tapped into that need for adventure for me, I was just watching TV in my apartment in Toronto. But but we want our called to this adventure. We hope for something like a television show to come our way or maybe something even smaller, like just taking time off of everyday life to pursue your passions. There's something about putting yourself in a position where you have to do it because others are counting on you. There's something about being forced into that position that actually gets stuff done. And so for a man who's never ridden around the world on a motorcycle before, who's never hosted a television show before, who doesn't know anything about the cultures or the languages or what to expect on this trip, who stepped away from his wife and his kids and his job that's paying the mortgage, for four and a half months. How the hell do you prepare for something like that? We, we did a lot of SAS training and, and also just sort of hostile environmental training, which is all very funny and good fun. And we did we did um, first aid and, and all that kind of stuff. But these all ex-SAS uh, soldiers. And, um, and one of them said to us, and, uh, and I think it was really true as well. He said, look, if you can, if you can survive the prep, he said the journey is easy. And an element of that is true, you know, that there's so much prep when you finally get going. And that's the bit that you've always wanted, you know, so that was the thing. But I don't think either of us even had a clue that um, that it would become successful. We just thought we'd, we'd, we'd get a DVD and a book out of the journey and, you know, we could sit at 80 years old, you know, and, and say laughing with it. each other, and laughing and taking the piss out of each other for that we'd done it and we had no idea that that, that people would actually watch it. We, why why, why a, is that? Because because there's a, there's a definitely a big gap between having the idea, mm. actually doing it, and, and you know, it, it helps that you had contracts and you felt obliged to and you couldn't chicken out, you couldn't back out or what have you. Yeah, yeah, but, that does definitely help. Yeah. But so you have that accountability, but but there's a gap between you 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 doing it and then you release it to the world. And I mean it it had interest and you guys have such camaraderie and it's funny and there's drama. Like if we're going back to the original series, I mean, like each series to me has like a, a keyword and, and the first one is 
mud in Mongolia. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I'm sure there was many more parts to the trip, but it's just like, my goodness. And the second series is more like, um, how can we get the wives involved? And the third series is like, where can we find electricity? I mean, those are, mm. those are yeah. how I boil no, them down. For sure. But- <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think, but I remember just as we were leaving London, you know, I, I remember um, having a conversation with Dave and, and um, I said, uh, uh, David Agazanian, who was one of the producers, and I said, look, David, I said, I know we pulled all this money together, but but I'm, I'm leaving for four and a half months and I'm leaving my wife and, and two children and the mortgage and, and where we're having some renovation work done. Um, and, and I said, I don't really have very much money in the bank. I, I was sort of wondering if I could get an advance so that I can cover um I can cover my family from the time I'm away. And he went, no, of course you can. He said, Jesus, he said the quarter of it's all, all quarter of whatever we get is yours. It's not, you know. And he says, how much do you want? And I was like, oh my God, you know. And so 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 you know only a week or so before we left, I'd managed to get enough money in the bank to to sort of bankroll my wife while I was away. So that was for me, you know, you and sort of suggesting we do this trip and that we decide to make it into a book and a TV show, you know, changed my life completely. And, 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 you know, and we're sitting here talking to you now, having done in three long ways and, and four or five other TV shows and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's been, you know, I'm very thankful that little bit in my heart that was sort of felt sad because I've, I was going to give all that up was relit and, and, and this is burning brightly still. Could you, could you have possibly predicted in a million years when you were, you know, struggling as an actor, when you're working and doing home renovation, when this idea comes to you, when you don't have enough money to even carry it out, could you have even predicted that five years, 10 years, (laughs) 20 years later, you you you'd be like a known person who could dedicate their life to your passions to adventure racing or and and taking people on tours and doing all of this stuff no oh god no not at all i mean it was and and you know what was funny because we we had this this thing and i remember when russ and dave were, were in the edit suite and and putting it together and, and dave, russ came up and said look I, I he said i don't i i don't think this is that this is that bad i, I think I, don't, I think it's pretty good you know and we're going well oh, you know no but it was it was it was such a roller coaster. It really was, and and Ewan was was on fire with all his new movies, and he he moved over to the you know he was moving over to the states, and and uh, it, it was it was it was quite a it was quite a time. It really was. It, there was a lot of change for for both of us. This experience, being a part of the show, long way around, it changed his life. Oh, love it so much. I want to sit on that for a moment. Because it wasn't the idea that changed his life or the fact that he had a famous friend that didn't change his life. It wasn't connecting with the producers or the free merchandise, which is pretty cool because, by the way, BMW gave them motorcycles for the trip. (laughs) That's badass. But none of that changed his life. It's that they actually did it. They said yes to the idea. They reached out to people. They put in the work and they pitched people and, and they had people tell them that it was a bad idea and then they shot a proof of concept and when they got the green light they then rode 31,000 kilometers around the world think about that but the long way around that was their first tv show and in fact it was actually just the beginning for charlie all good ideas need um, a bit of luck in order for them to be successful and, and, and timing of when it comes out is, is is crucial. And I think that when when this came out, I think I think people were just starting to to, to not want just a beach holiday. They wanted to go out and, and have a bit of an adventure and then a beach holiday for the last few days of you know, so four or five days of adventure just and then to recover. a few days on the beach <laughs> to recover. But I think people were looking for more out of their out of their thing. And I think I think Long Way just just happened to sort of come along just at that right time and we kind of rode the crest of that wave of 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 adventure adventure holidays and and that and that thing of people wanting more so i think the timing was was really was really crucial i think and to to the success but that but but that you know but i remember once it started getting getting its pace i i I, you and i always spoke about you know having a dakar moment a long way 
so we go along in the sand and we go, oh, I'm having a Dakar moment. The Dakar rally had always been in my mind ever since I was a kid. It was hugely popular in Ireland when I grew up, the, you know, the Dakar rally or Paris Dakar. And it was always kept in my mind. And then I started to think of this idea along with, with Russ about doing Race to Dakar, which was the sort of thing I did straight after uh, Long Way Around. And, and then I eventually managed to get a TV show off. And it was off the back of me having my own TV show. And, and it was like, wow, okay. I, I, well, this is, this is cool. I can do something that I've always wanted to do and, 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 and earn a living. You know, and and that was that was quite revolutionary. It really was. And how um, much of a leap of faith was it to to do these kind of things? So so I've noticed that you know if someone comes into my life who has a vision, who is is working on something big, I'm so inspired by their leadership that I just want to like help them. I just want to help them do yeah. it. And and yet I find for each of us stepping into that leadership role is just scary as hell. And mm. so you know you have this opportunity, race to the car. Uh, I saw it when it first came out, and and that's not a series that I've like gone back to a few times. But I do I do remember just being mm. mortified when you when you injured yourself, like 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 just um, no, it yeah, was like, hard. That, it was that's, it. Hard. that's it. And so for those who don't know, I mean, the the, the race to the car used, used to be called. I mean, was it not? The Paris. Dakar? It, was, it, was, it was. It was called Paris Dakar, and right, the, you the race idea from Paris down to yeah. down to Africa. Yeah, down to the most westerly point, which is um, Dakar in, in uh, Senegal, and and um, and it was it was formulated by, by this this desert racer French guy who got lost in the desert, and he was lost for four or five days, and he walked out with his life, um, and he'd come up with this idea to do this Paris Dakar, and. Um, and then the reason he did it in January was because he just looked at the calendar of all the all the car and motorcycle racing and everything that was going on, and he looked at that in the in January there was nothing going on in the world, and so he he said right we're going to do it on um, New Year's Day is when we start, and then sixteen days to oh well it was longer then because you started in Paris and then went all the way through France into into Africa, yeah. and um and and it's turned out to be. If if you're a dirt bike rider or 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 um, a rally like driver, rally raiding rally driver, then that's the ultimate race in the world, it's the most dangerous race in the world, and and for off road. And then if you want to if you want to race, um, if you want to race on tarmac, um, in and then the the Isle of Man TT is the yeah. most dangerous race in the world, and so. And I always wanted to to be in a race that 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 had a, that I had a, a race number, and that it that that it really meant a proper race, a proper race number. And it, <laughs> somehow, how, I ended how did up you not have line. how did you not have imposter syndrome? Not only so, not only are you carrying the weight of the race, you know, this not being your career. I mean, you're, you're good, but but you weren't you weren't professional. Oh, uh, no, so you're so, you, so you're stepping into that. You're producing a tv show you're the star of the show you're the presenter i mean like like it's how did you not crumble really, under the pressure man i do remember i do remember um uh yeah i mean the, the, it was it was brutal uh it was a year's training and it was it was brutal because i when i started riding off road with this guy simon pavey that i was going to do the dakar rally with you know i realized i wasn't as good off road as i thought i was and and i realized that my 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 I was going to have to work really hard, so that was one thing. So I had to, because you have to be be of of um, you have to be in a in a in a three day enduro, and you have to you have to finish well. So 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 you have to be within the top handfuls of riders to be able to qualify. <laughs> so I had to go from from way down here to way way up there, and it was like oh my god. Yeah, but I, I do remember freaking out uh, the night before. So you have these road books, these paper road books, which tell you a kilometer one seven five, you know, treble danger into old riverbed um, on exit compass bearing one nine five, and and that's it. And and you have to scroll and do everything yourself. And 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 um and I remember. The night before it all started, I was in the hotel room with my wife and my kids were there to see me off. And they were all in the room and I had this, this, this robe and you're supposed to mark it so you can highlight the really dangerous bits. And 
Ollie and the kids were asking me questions. Basically, I said to Ollie, Ollie, look, I, and I had this rope that just poured all over the, the bedroom, the, the bedroom floor. And I said, look, Ollie, I said, you just you got to take the kids and go out for an hour or two hours because I've just got to get my head it sorted out. So, but it was quite funny because what you do is at the beginning of the race, you have this platform and you ride up a bit like the, a bit like Baja. You know, it's 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 the Baja is only twenty four hours. This is sixteen days, but it's the same kind of thing. You know, super dangerous, um, uh, super fast, and they, you come up onto a onto a platform, and they introduce you to the crowd. Who, you know, this is a, in the in the middle of the night on New Year's Eve, and, and the crowd, most of the crowd, are completely drunk out of their minds <laughs> because it's New Year's Eve, and so and you get completely carried away by the whole thing. I remember riding up onto this platform and, and I came up with my two teammates, Simon and Matt, and we were standing there and they were, then they, they said your names. We looked up and you saw the crowd and they were cheering. And I, just for a moment, I thought I could win this. <laughs> 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 and then, and then I, and then I rode up and then I almost fell off the, um, the podium as I went down and I thought, okay, no, 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 maybe I won't win this. I'll, maybe I'll just, just finish it would be good. So, um, and then kind of off I went and, and, um, and then, you know, five days later I broke my hands and, and had a, had a horrific um, journey out of the desert and, and, um, and my race was over, but in some ways it, it, it turned out okay for the TV show because then, then I ended up sort of, sort of managing the team and, filming everything that went on in the background and 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 so that so this whole whole thing and i was walking around with two broken hands you know trying to be helpful and it was most i remember you know people would just say i, I mean that, i remember the doctor told me when i when i had the x-rays and they'd broken both my hands and uh the doctor says charlie says uh, uh you know uh, you've broken both your hands it's impossible to to ride a motorbike anymore he said uh, not only that i'm not even sure if you're going to be able to wipe your own ass <laughs> he was wrong i could get a baby wipe on this finger and i could just reach around so well that's that that's, what the, that's what the wrapping was for right that's what the wrapping for exactly yeah exactly. but uh, but i just remember just my whole world collapsing I, I got back on the bike and i could sort of hold on after the, it was a nothing crash as well and um i could sort of hold on and i started to ride off again thinking well i'll just go to the medical tent and they'll put a bandage on and I'll be fine, you know. And um, and I said, there's only this hand anyway. And then I was riding along. And then I realized that my left hand was hurting. I looked down at my left hand and my thumb was just flopping around. Um, it was just sort of flopping around. And I was looking at my hand thinking, oh, that's not good. That's two hands. That's not great. <laughs> Those and are kind all, of to, my hands, all, all my hands. All my hands. hands I haven't gone anymore. <laughs> I could hold with my teeth maybe, you know. And then then I had to bang my thumb on the on the handlebar to pop the, the my thumb back in in place and then i anyway rode for another 450 kilometers or so and um uh and by the time i got to the end of the day it was it was clear that it was done my hands were so swollen and on these long rides i mean you just have a lot of time you have just a lot of time to just you know chase your shadows or or ride into sun you know mm -hmm. there's this idea that that these adventure rides are very romantic you know but then the reality is you're just like getting pelted <laughs> with stuff and your you know your legs hurt and your back hurts and you're tired and your boot your feet are swelling because the boots are wet and just like just the reality of it and and so through these challenges you've you've kind of posed for yourself what have you learned about yourself i think that your mind is 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 very good at sort of forgetting the really hard bits and, and sort of romanticizing on all the best bits once you've finished. So it's a bit like a friend of mine, she said, oh, that sounds a bit like childbirth, she said, because because if you remembered the whole lot of it, she said, mankind would stop. My so wife says that, that by the way. We've got, we've got four kids and she <laughs> she is and like... If she could really remember, <laughs> she'd never have another one. But I do think, I, re I, I remember on the first one and 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 the same feeling happened on 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 all of them and um i i lost my sister talsha um uh about 25 years ago and she had a varying cancer and she she lost her battle and I, I was very lucky that she she saw my firstborn daughter before she died and held her in her arms and um and she was you know of course gifted and wonderful person and and uh, a very talented writer i remember when she died it, it was you know i mean to, to lose your sibling is 
is terrible. And I always felt awful for my parents as well to, to lose your firstborn child. It just, I don't know how you would, you know, survive that. And, um, but, but because we, we just had our first child and then we quickly had our second and then life just barrels on and you're just trying to keep your head above water. You know, I, I always grieve for Tasha, but, but, but when we went on this, on, on, on the first one, you know, we, there were days where you'd have long, 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 um, periods of time and thing and, and your mind would just would wander and that this is part of the really this is part of the good thing about riding motorcycles and doing long journeys is is that you you know it gives you the time to think and and I would think a lot about Talsha and and um and 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 you know would have a little cry on my helmet and 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 you know suddenly for the first time in a long time had time to to think about and grieve about my sister and and then all sorts of other things would come into our minds and you and would pull up one one day and say, oh, you know, Charlie, I was just thinking about this person in school and hadn't thought about that person for, for years and years and years and years. And so I think, I mean, we talk a lot the, these days about mindfulness and about mental health and about, you know, where you are in, in, in your, in yourself. And, and, and I think, I think motorcyclists, I think have a, have a, they have a good gig going because, because always when you put that helmet on, if you're riding back from work or, or you're doing your, your weekend or your couple of hours ride or whatever it is, you know, it's very lethargic because you, 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 you either you just don't think about anything and just the ride or you allow yourself to, 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 to think about things that you haven't thought about. And I think it, it, it I think it, it, it mentally, I think it works very well riding a motorcycle. And, and so you've been able to build a career out of, out of this now. I mean, you, you take people on Don't tours. Tell anyone. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 well, it's it's interesting because I about seven months ago, I watched the original series with my son again. You know, yeah. it was spring here. We weren't able to dirt bike. I live in Canada. Um, you know, we weren't able to, to get out there. So oh, let's watch this series. You know, he's 13. And so he's like, oh, is, you know, the, the camera helmets. Oh, like GoPros. Well, yeah, but GoPros weren't really around. And um, oh, like, uh, oh, this is just like a, you know, a, a motorcycle vlog. Yeah, but you have to understand YouTube hadn't been invented yet. And like, and so it's <laughs> so ahead of its time. And at the same time, my son's like, why are there commercial breaks? Why are they <laughs> like, it's, it's yeah, a TV I show, <laughs> kid. I know. Was... But he doesn't, he doesn't know. I, I, I was in, when we, we were in South Africa ages ago. And, um, uh, with my kids after a long way down um, when, you know, we, on the second trip we did, we rode down through, through Africa from Scotland to Cape town. And, and, um, and we were in Cape town and we'd gone to this market and, and this, and I saw these handbags and I thought, God, these are genius. And what the guy had done he, is he, he'd gotten records and he cut them in half and then had put them up and had made them, made them handbags out of them and got reclaimed plastic and got it on all around. So, and I'm going to my girls, look at this. These, these, these use records to make handbags out of it. And they just looked at me and they said, what's the record? <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh. okay. I mean, now I... it's completely changed again now because now all the kids want to buy vinyl now, you know, but, but in those days, you know, then it was like, you know, what yeah. is that? You know, but you've built this career now. So like, and, yeah. and that's, and yeah. that's what, you know, that's what I wanted to get back to real quick, simply because part of our mission here, part of our mandate, part of what I love to do is, is feature people who have been able to take their past experiences, take their passions, go out and do something extraordinary and unique and different and somehow support themselves, somehow build a life, build a career pursuing hmm. their passions. And I think most of us are too afraid to do it. Now, in your story, you could say you got lucky, but that's not 100% true. You could say right place at right time and all of these things. But again, that's not all together true because you still conceived of it. You still did it. You still pursued yeah. it. You still built. And so um, what do you say for those of us who are still working the job or have not taken the leap, you know, like that, that, you know, are you one of the rare lucky few or is this something that more of us could do? I think it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I still can't quite understand how I got here, really, to be honest. I, I just kept I just kept doing it. It's a little bit like, you know, if, if you really want that car, you'll find a way to get the money, you know, and, and, uh, and even if that it's way out of station. Yeah. So. So if if you really want something, you will go at it. And 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 as much as it, you know, the TV shows and stuff 
are fantastic fun. There's a lot of work that goes on in the background, so it is a lot of work. And and but it is it is a lot of luck as well. And, and it's about timing. You can release something that 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 is a good body of work, but it's just the wrong timing, and no one really goes to see it. So at the top of this episode, I mentioned that I'm a huge fan. And so I kind of take for granted that I've seen all the different shows. So I want to break things down a little bit. If you've not figured it out at this point, Charlie and Ewan have done three trips together. The first was called Long Way Round. And that's where they rode the 31,000 kilometers through Europe and Asia, all the way kind of to Russia. And then went, they took a plane from Russia to Alaska. And then they continued by road to New York. And they did this in 2004 on some BMWs. And then the second trip was called Long Way Down, where they rode all the way from the northern part of Scotland, all the way down through Europe and Africa to, to South Africa, to Cape Town. And they did that on BMWs in 2007. And then recently, they did their third trip. They called this Long Way Up, where they rode from the southernmost part of South America, all the way through South America to Los Angeles. But doing that trip, on their trusty BMWs? Well, I guess that seemed too easy. Someone had the idea that they should do this on Harley Davidsons. And for our non-motorcycle people, Harleys are not known for this type of adventure riding. And you know what? Let's just make things a little harder. They chose to do this on electric motorcycles. I've had a couple of bad, bad crashes. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, after a long way, uh, down, <clears throat> you and you and moved over to had been was over in the states and and and, and you know and, and and we were sort of living parallel lives, but but we we we, we were, he would come over to Europe to make a movie, I'd be off making a TV show somewhere else, and we just kept missing each other, so we kind of just drifted along, and and then when I had my motorcycle crash in Portugal, uh, where I'd smashed both my legs up really yeah, badly, that, that was quite serious. That was pretty bad. Yeah, my leg was hanging off and the bones were... And there's still a piece of bone that is... Because my leg is shorter now, but there's a piece of bone somewhere in Portugal where I had my crash that's on the side of the road somewhere. I I, 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 I hope that, that some little critter came along and found it and, and had a meal, you know. But but I, I do miss it, that piece of bone. And 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 um, so it was a really big one. Both my legs, I was bed bound for a long time. And then I think I think because of that, and then I had a, another one, another really bad one in Africa two years later, where I I I, I snapped this in, in half and bent it backwards, and all the bones came out, and I had a terrible head injury and broke my pelvis and collarbone and had everything plated, and 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 I think the head injury was was bad. Um, and I remember waking up sort of twenty hours later in hospital and thinking, you know. Where am I? And then, and then, and then, Euron, I was stuck in, in London, and then Euron was over, over here making a movie, and, and we started chatting again. And, and then he came over to, to spend the night and was making a movie there and ended up spending a month there at, at, at our house, which was fantastic. And we just had all this time to reconnect, and we'd always spoken about maybe doing another one. And, and so we just started talking about the good old days and, you know, maybe doing another one. And, and Russ and Dave came over to have some dinner. And uh, I was still, in, I was, I was back in a wheelchair because of this second operation. And then we started talking about, it. and then Russ mentioned, he said, well, you know, well, what about electric? And 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 it was like, well, okay, hang on. Well, we knew we could jump on a petrol bike and do it, you know, be easy because we had the experience from the last two. And we both thought, actually, do you know what? This would be the right thing to do. And and I tell you, sometimes I really wish it hadn't. <laughs> I mean, there were definite times where we thought, you know, let's just ditch them and get petrol, you know. But everyone said it couldn't be done. Every time someone mentions petrol, oh, yeah, but the range, you can't do it because of the range. And and so now I, I, people say, oh, you know, I wouldn't take a motorbike because they just can't go anywhere. And I, wonder what, I said, well, actually, actually, you can, actually. And, 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 you just and, have to go very slowly with a yeah, lot of well, downtime. <laughs> but, but it was interesting because it, we... It, it, Going all through South America with you and I, we, we we had to plug in and 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 what was lovely is that you were plugging into people's houses, but not only were you plugging in to take their their fuel, but you were plugging into their lives. So we we had a completely different experience because of it. So so we met lots more people. We we ended up in lots more people's houses. We people cooked us meals. We, it was a totally different experience and and I, i'm very grateful for it and 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 when you're doing a road trip a couple of hundred miles 250 miles a day is 
it's plenty. And and this is what I love again. And this is what I love about documentary yeah. storytelling is is you learn through these casual comments. And Ewan says at one point, "Well, uh, I guess the uh, the interruptions are the journey after all." Yeah. And it's like that is the truth for everything, for everything. You know, like yeah. like in work, <laughs> in 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 art, in life, with family, with relationships. The interruptions are the distraction from our goal, from the things we want, but it's what... But they're, 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 that's what makes the goal even better to get to. It's like when you're... <clears throat> if you go on holiday and you have unbelievable... You send a beautiful hotel and you the most amazing service and beautiful beach and, you know, that 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 James Bond moment when he... They always seem to, to find the most beautiful places, locations... And and you're there all week, and and you come back, and but you can't really remember what what happened. But but if you if you happen to get out and, and, and rent a car and go across the island, and, and and you have a flat tire, or you break down, or or something happens, and you end up meeting these people, who then eventually tell you, oh, you must go. Well, when when you've changed the tire, you must go and have lunch at that place, and you go and have, and you're like, wow, you know. And and out of that week, that is the bit that you'll remember. You know, so I, I think he's absolutely right, Ewan, in, in, in the fact that, you know, the interruptions are, are the thing. I remember that whole thing in, when Claudio's bike kept breaking down in the middle of Mongolia and we were, had these big toolkits out to, to try and fix this bike. We had no clue what to do. And these, these Mongolians came along. Uh, they stopped and because everybody stops for everybody in Mongolia because, he, 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 you know, if you, if you make a mistake and break down, you know, you're in big trouble. And, um, uh, Anyway, they saw us with all these Mac tool, um, uh, uh, snap-on tool, tool kits, and 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 um, and they must have just laughed at each other and thought, yeah, "Here's the guys with, you know, all the gear and absolutely no idea, you know." And and um, and they just fixed it with their tools, and off we went. So, but th- those are the bits I, I remember most about those two guys jumping out the car and, you know, literally taking over and fixing Claudio's bike. I remember that as yesterday. If you ask me about other bits and pieces, that bit in the in the TV show where you about, went along that being, bit of being robbed no at gunpoint. <laughs> How oh, about yeah, that no, one? That's, that's always uh, that's always uh, yeah, that's always uh, that's always quite sharp in the mind. Igor, you know, um, in his house when he walks down the stairs with a clash with all, and with a guitar. All the guns. Yeah, and he comes walks down the stairs with a clash up and a and a guitar in his hands, and he goes, "You make love, not war," and then sings this amazing song. You know, <laughs> I love all that, and 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 I think when we did Long Way Up, getting the team all back together again, and and with Russ and Dave, and and and, and you know, they're so brilliant at, at at pulling all of that together so that you and I can have have this adventure. You know, and you always have your ups and downs. It's, I, I I always say that. That you know, when you go on these long trips, it's a it's a little bit like a mini marriage. You know, you're 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 because you're living with each other the whole time. You're doing making decisions all the time with each other. You know, and, and you have your ups and downs. And you know, at, at one point in the day, they're really annoying you. The other part of the day, you have a great time. And a lot of that is boils down to food as well. You know, if if, if the more grisly and the more you find things difficult, it's usually because you're becoming more and more hungry. So and then the minute you have a bit of food, you know everything seems easy again. You know, and, and so speaking about hard things, you know, this is the We Do Hard Things podcast, so we like to focus on those who are willing to say yes to the hard and the scary and the difficult things. As as you've gone through series after series, and you've done many, you've done many many different television series, and as as you're looking forward, I guess at the next five or ten or twenty years of your career, what's what's next? I mean, how do you continue to raise the bar raise the stakes or chase that adventure or or how do you how do you feed that part of your your soul well i always think i'm a bit stupid so i i, I never seem to learn anything so i just keep doing it again you know it's like i feel a bit sometimes i feel like a goldfish you know i come around come around goldfish ball and think well, hang on a minute I, I seem to have got myself into trouble again you know i've got as i said i've got a lot to thank you and for 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 you know for his friendship and his kindness and his generosity and for being my mate. And, and I think I, I, I got my father to thank a lot as well, because all the movies that he made, you know, Deliverance, Excalibur, Hope and Glory, and Wolf Forest, Point Blank, you know, just to name but a few of his films, all of them are very adventurous movies. And, and we traveled all over the world 
um, with my father and, 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 you know, he was always doing, you know, people would always say to dad, oh, you know, this is a possible movie to make. You can't do that. Can't make the actors go down all those rapids in, in, in deliverance. He goes, yes, I can. And, and he did, you know, and he made a career out of his passion and, and, and he dragged us along. So I think, I think he instilled that sense of adventure in me. He, he, he's always there on the back of the bike with me or, 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 you know, or my sister Tasha is always sitting on my shoulder. Um, so there's lots of, lots of help. At this point, what scares you? Because it, it seems like you go headlong into things. Someone, um, Simon Pavey said to me, and um, with the guy who I did the Dakar rally with, he said to me, Charlie, he said, you've got to scare yourself at least twice a, a week just to, just to keep things keep things sharp you know and i think he's right you know so i spent a lot of time downhill mountain biking and uh and i hit myself at least four or five times of an evening and i've started to do night riding now so i go out with a bunch of guys here i live in in the surrey hills which is one of the best places in southern britain for downhill mountain biking and um and we, we and we i uh, joined this group of people who who go out um night riding so we take torches and so we do all the downhill mountain bike things, you know, all those really tricky ones where you hit jumps and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And so you, you, you so do that blindly. <laughs> yeah. So we, so it's bad enough in the day. Now we, I now, now I stick a big torch to my head and we do the same ones in the middle of the night. So well, that scares me. Um, I think it scares me that I wouldn't be able to do another TV show and have another adventure. That scares me. My wife scares me, um, uh, but in a good way. Yeah. And that's about it really. But with, you know? with all this adventuring, what are you, um, I guess, what are you chasing or what are you running from? I'm just trying to pay the bills. <laughs> Is that really it? <laughs> no, I, 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 I do feel like these last 18 months um, of, of, of lockdown and stuff has been quite difficult. I, I, um, I, I miss terribly being abroad somewhere uh, different. You know, one of my favorite continents in the world to go to is Africa and, and I haven't been there for a while and, and, and I love that. I love being in places uh, that are out of the way, that are different to sitting in Europe or sitting in the States. You know, we, I think we all have it, or the Canada, we all have it very, very sweet here, you know. And so last question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? I feel extremely happy on the back of a motorcycle. Um, riding out there in, in, in strange places. Um, and, and that's all the better for coming home. You know, that makes it really sweet. It's lovely to be able to do something that, that you love doing and, 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 you know, being able to keep your head above water by, by, by doing that. That's, that's pretty special. And, and um, I think it's very lucky. I look at Valentino Rossi and, and, um, and Mark Marquez and all those kind of guys and think, wow, what, what an, amazing life they've been able to they've been able to carve a life out of riding motorcycles and then i think oh i've done that too <laughs> exactly exactly charlie has done it just like the people he looks up to and for you the listener i hope you realize that you can do this too okay three key takeaways from this conversation number one charlie admits that deep down there was a sadness that he couldn't pursue his career as an actor so for you, I want you to dig deep and I want you to ask if you have a type of sadness, if you have that type of regret, because it's easy to give yourself a pass and to make excuses why you're not pursuing your passions, why you're in fact settling for something else. But I want you to hone in on that uncomfortable truth. You were built for something more. You are settling by not pursuing it. I want you to use how uncomfortable that feels as fuel to make those dreams happen. Number two, we often think that it's all about the journey, but the preparation is a part of the journey. If you're going to run a marathon or perform in the Olympics, like some of our other guests that we've had on the podcast, you may think that winning or losing comes down to how you do on the day. But living an adventure-filled life is about the entire process. And if you can get through the prep, turns out the journey is easy. Okay, number three. It does not come from today's guest, Charlie, but in fact from Ewan, but I love it all the same. 
Remember that every time you feel like you're being pulled away from the stuff that you have to do, that you want to do, you're in fact handed a gift. And that gift is the chance to follow this new, unexpected path to meet new people, to experience unforeseen adventures, and to find yourself living the kind of life that's worthy of a book or television show, or who knows, how big can you dream? Now, if you have that big dream, you have got to face the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this plus size endurance athlete, the woman behind the blog Fat Girl Running, how she turned her love for the sport into a career, becoming a fully sponsored professional athlete. Click on the video right over there for more real inspiring stories.